Well, good morning, morning. and welcome to St. Paul United Methodist Church. I am Joe Tuminello, formerly known as the piano player's husband. (laughs) We're so glad you're here on this sixth Sunday of the Epiphany. If you're worshiping with us online today, we're glad that you're with us. We hope everyone fills out the digital connect card, which can be found on our St. Paul app at stpaulumc.org. Are there paper copies available in the Connection Center as well? You can also stay connected with us throughout the week on our St. Paul app on Facebook and on Instagram. The season of Lent is about to begin. Lent is a season of prayer and preparation that begins on Ash Wednesday. We hope you will join us on Wednesday, February 22nd at 6.30 in the Worship Center here or online, join us with our handy, capable ministry for this special worship. And I want to plug these guys because they are a wonderful group. And we were so blessed to be able to, um, to attend that, uh, the Valentine party for Handy Capable, and it was a blast. So I'm looking forward to worshiping with those guys. Also, a quick reminder that on Tuesday, we have a special uh, Valentine yoga class and also our senior expo. Now, as we continue to worship, let us stand and let's welcome and greet.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Patsy Schutzendorf, and our scripture that reading this morning comes from Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8. Hear the word of the Lord. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our first hymn this morning, number 381, Savior, like a shepherd lead us. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 3.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Well, it's good to see you, and we welcome you to this service this morning. Amen. On his uh, deathbed, playwright Wilson Misner was approached by a priest who said, I guess you want to talk to me. And Misner said, why should I want to talk to you? I've just been speaking with your boss. <laughs> On his deathbed, John Wesley's famous last words were, the best of all is God is with us. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on last words, especially if the person knew that these were going to be their last words. And uh, we, we figure that if they knew, then these words are going to be important. And that was the case with Jesus. Jesus was hanging on a cross. He was dying. And so he knew these words that he uttered from the cross would be the last words he spoke before his death. And so they are important words. Uh, they're important words for us to hear, and they're important words for us to learn to put into practice. There are seven sayings in the gospel uh, from Jesus while he was on the cross. And we call these seven sayings the, the seven last words of Christ. And so over the next seven weeks, we're going to examine these sayings. What did Jesus say to us from the cross? And knowing that these were the last words that he would utter before his death, then we believe these are important words. These are words that matter. And so this morning, we're going to begin with these cross-shaped words. Uh, and I want to read to you the scripture. It's Luke 23. When they came to a place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. <laughs> Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Those are shocking words. Those are surprising words. Those are not the words you would expect from the lips of a man who's just been crucified. Those are probably not the words you and I would have uttered on the cross. Certainly not the words that the soldiers standing there with hammer still in hand were used to hearing from people they had just nailed to a cross. Forgive them. Forgive who? Who was Jesus asking the Father to forgive? Was it the soldiers? I mean, there they are. They're the ones earlier who had made fun of him and beat him senseless. They mocked him. They cursed at him. They drove spikes through his bare arms and feet. And without batting an eye, they lifted him up on the cross. And once Jesus' body became vertical, he could hardly breathe. Jesus looked at them with his blood already dried on their fists. Could he be talking about forgiving the soldiers? Really? What about the religious leaders? They were there too. And unlike the sweaty soldiers, they were clean. They hadn't gotten dirty. They had someone else to do their violence for them. But they had mocked him. They had made fun of him. They were poster boys for how to kick a man when he's down. The soldiers may have been the one who drove the nails, but these were the guys who got the whole thing rolling. And Jesus knew that. Forgive them? Really? And then there's the crowd, mostly ignorant of what happened. They just smelled the blood and joined in. They hurled their insults. I mean, it was no more to them than just a sporting event. Forgive them? Really? Forgive them for they know not what they do. The soldiers were just following orders. That's what soldiers do. And the religious leaders, they were just, you know, keeping the rules and upholding the faith. If you, if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything, right? 
And the crowd was intentionally ignorant because it's easier to follow your emotions and prejudices than it is to find out the truth. So Jesus was accused of being a threat to the religious and the institutional status quo. And Barbara Brown Taylor understood the irony involved in all of this when she wrote, So the scandal of his death was not that an innocent man died, but that he was killed in the name of justice and faith by people who believed they were doing the right thing. And there was Caiaphas. He was the protector of the people. Caiaphas had been working with the Romans for 15 years to keep Jewish people safe and to make sure they would be able to worship and to make sure they would have peace. And not, nobody liked being in an occupied country. <laughs> nobody certainly liked paying Roman taxes. But it beat the alternative. Because the alternative was that if you rebel against Rome, they will crush you. And it will be a massacre. And Caiaphas was spending every day trying to avoid that. And make sure that didn't happen like it ended up happening in AD 70. And so when he heard some rabble rouser from Galilee was out stirring up the crowds, it made him nervous. Some were even calling him the Messiah. I mean, Jerusalem was a powder keg ready to go. And Jesus was starting to look a lot like the match. So Caiaphas, it was his job to put out the fire. And so, as he saw it, better one man die than many. His math was right. He was just doing his job. Forgive Caiaphas? Really? And then there was Pilate. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, the creed says. And Pilate had nothing against Jesus personally. When they turned Jesus over to him, he tried to give him back. And then he sent him off to Herod to try to get rid of him. And then uh, he tried to release him. And Jesus stood before him silent as a monk. And outside the mob was crying for blood. And Pilate hadn't even had his coffee yet. And he's just trying to figure out what to do. His job is to keep the peace. If he just turns him over, then they'll settle down. And everything will work out. He, he, he's just doing his job. Forgive Pilate? Really? They did away with God in the name of peace and quietness, author Dorothy Sayers writes. <laughs> he was not killed by vice or corruption. He was killed by piety and due process. Jesus was crucified by people standing under the umbrella of doing the right thing, and it's so easy to convince ourselves of our own rightness. So easy to convince ourselves of our own righteousness. And then we're surprised at the results we sometimes get. Pilate, the politician, the priests in their robes, soldiers in their uniforms, and the crowd in their blue jeans, all staring at a brown man who can't breathe, and wondering how in the world did it ever get this far with everybody just thinking they're doing the right thing. You know, it'd be easy now at this point to, to talk about how Jesus forgave us um, and, and make it a nice sermon about how Jesus died on the cross for our sins so we can be forgiven. But if it's possible, I would like for us to do something different uh, in, instead of our normal um, theological narcissist to not make this about us. Let's make this about Jesus. Um, it's about the one hanging on the cross. It's not about us. And we're certainly in need of forgiveness, no doubt. But, but it's about the one dying on the cross. Take a good look at the God we serve. God demonstrates for us an ability to forgive that is beyond anything most of us can imagine. I mean, we're pretty good at sinning, but we're no match for God's grace and God's mercy. 
Take a good look, not at what Jesus did for us, but at what Jesus did, because that's who Jesus is. That's who God is. That is God's great love. And so today, let's not focus on our sins, but on God's great love. Because our sin, as great as it is, pales in comparison to the greatness of God's love and God's forgiveness. Forgive them. Forgive the soldiers. Forgive the crowd. Forgive the religious leaders. Forgive Caiaphas. Forgive Pilate. And yes, forgive us too. But what if Jesus prayed this prayer not just so that we would know we're forgiven, but so that we might also emulate this in our own lives, that we might learn to forgive? In his next volume, the book of Acts, Luke tells the story of a young man named Stephen. And Stephen was a disciple in the young church in Jerusalem, but opposition arose to the church and they were being persecuted. And so um, some of the leaders, set, they set up Stephen on false charges. They brought him before the Sanhedrin, which is the same court that Jesus went before, on the same charges that Jesus was charged with. Now, they did listen to Stephen preach a sermon that is at least three pages long in my Bible. But when he got to that last part about them being stiff-necked and sinful people, they had heard enough. And, and they got so mad, Luke says, that they gnashed their teeth. And they dragged Stephen outside. They circled up around him. They picked up stones. And in their anger, they began to throw stones against Stephen's body. And as the stones pounded against him, he prayed, Jesus, receive my spirit. And as he fell to his knees, he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. In other words, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so Stephen understood that Jesus' death on the cross not only meant that he was forgiven, but it meant that now he was able to forgive others. That now he had the strength to actually live and die like Jesus and that's what it means for us all as well. Now, I have to tell you something. I did not know this until this week when I was studying for this message. I discovered that those words, Jesus' prayer in the Greek New Testament, are in brackets. The words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, are in brackets. And the reason they're in brackets is because if you, in some of the early manuscripts, those words are not there. Now, I will spare you the technical arguments, but uh, just to say that I agree with the large majority of scholars that these are the authentic words of Jesus. But sometimes when they're missing in a manuscript, people wonder, did some scribes add those words? But what most scholars really believe is that no, but there was a few scribes who deleted them. And so when you see that, you wonder why. Why would someone entrusted with the task of copying Holy Scripture dare leave part of it out? Well, during the time those manuscripts were being copied, Christians were still being persecuted by the Romans and the Jews. The very people from the cross, Jesus asked God to forgive. And the consensus is that some of those scribes copying the manuscripts changed the scripture because they could not bear the thought that God was forgiving their enemies. Now let that sink in. These are people charged with the holy task of copying Scripture, and yet they left part of it out because it didn't agree with their prejudice. And unfortunately, that's not the last time that's happened. I mean, these were supposed to be the good guys. 
But they failed because they left forgiveness out of some of the manuscripts. Just like we fail if we leave forgiveness out of our hearts. it's, It's a difficult story, this one. Just following orders like the soldiers. Just keeping the peace like Pilate. Just defending the faith like Caiaphas. Remaining willfully ignorant like the crowd. Father, forgive them. Forgive us. We just sometimes don't understand what we're doing. Jesus died with forgiveness on his lips so that we might learn to live with forgiveness in our hearts. We have been forgiven. So let us learn to forgive. Amen. Amen. church. Uh-huh. Amen again. One more time. Amen. Iron sharpens iron. Uh-huh. 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 That, that word cut to the heart. Amen. <clears throat> God of the ages, verses one and two. Amen. <laughs> Please remain standing and join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit it at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Please join me in prayer. Father, we pray today for the victims of the earthquake in Turkey and Syria. We pray that you be with the families of the victims, the first responders, the emergency workers, paramedics, all that are involved. Please, Lord, we pray that you be with them and comfort them and bring them peace. And Lord, we pray that right here in this church today that we have loved ones who are sick, who are suffering. And we just pray, Lord, that you be with with them, bring them peace and healing. God, I also want to pray for all the volunteers that we have in this church 
in all the different ministries, like our office staff, our pastors, and for all the people that every day volunteer their time for you, Lord. We want to thank you, God, that we can make a difference in someone's life. We are so grateful to be a part of the body of Christ. And we ask you, God, to take all of us and use all of us for your glory today. Let us plant the seeds of kindness wherever we go. And now let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you want to know more about becoming a Christ follower, being baptized, or what's next for you, I encourage you to fill out our digital connect card located on our St. Paul app at stpaulumc.org or on the link if you're worshiping online. We also have some paper copies out in the lobby. We want to celebrate a wonderful, messy church event last week. We had a great time learning about Jesus, enjoying a meal together, and making crafts. You can tell by the smiles on their faces, these in these uh, faces of these children in the photos. Our next messy church is on March the 12th. We also want to remind you, if you took a mission envelope and would like to donate to the student mission trip in March, please bring your donation in by February the 26th. We are thankful for the ways that you support St. Paul through prayer, presence, gifts, and service. If you would like to give a gift, you can do so online securely at stpaulumc.org. Or you can give today in the black boxes around the room or in a few minutes when the plates are passed around.
Dear God, we thank you and ask that you bless these gifts and those who gave, who gave them. And may they be used to further your kingdom. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our closing hymn, number 672. God be with you till we meet again. Verses 1 and 2. Amen. pleasure to be with you like every Sunday. Thanks for coming and being a part of this service. Thanks for joining us uh, online at home. Um, and um, Joe, thank you. Uh, is this your first time to leave? Didn't Joe do a great job this morning? Thank you. And Joe's going to be standing in the back, uh, and I will also be staying in the back. You can go ahead and make your way back there if you want. And I'll also be in the back. The Connection Center will be open. There'll be hot coffee. Uh, so if you want to argue about the Super Bowl a little later. You can go back there and do that for a little while. Um, I do hope you have a, a great afternoon. If you're a guest this morning, I do hope you'll take the time to stop and see either Joe or myself or someone in the Connection Center. We would love to meet you just to get to know a little bit about you. So, um, again, thank you so much for being here. And as you go, know this. It is by the goodness of God that you were brought into this world. It is by the grace of God that you're still here. And it is by the love of God, fully revealed in Jesus Christ, that you are being redeemed. Amen. Amen.